Amy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we've had a few mornings where it's been in the fifties and it's like, it's great sleeping weather and to not have to have air on, but then it's like when it only gets up into the low seventies during the day and our swimming pool is still open and I want to, you know, <laughs> grab some extra vitamin D to store it. It's like, oh, That's this fair. is over soon. I just. I just don't like it. I wasn't meant to live here. Somehow I ended up here. It's like God's joke or something for faith. <laughs> you, need your, you need your seasons, Faith. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I grew up with them. I mean, thanks for joining us, everybody. Um, appreciate you. We'll let people get logged in here for another few seconds or, go, or so. Um, yeah, I mean, I grew up with them in the middle of Iowa, so yeah. I just the older I get, the less appealing the cold weather is. It's yeah, probably I don't, for everybody. I don't disagree with that. I'm, un, I'm starting to understand it as I get older. I definitely <laughs> agree with that. You've got a long way to go. you got a long way to go. All right. Well, I think we will go ahead and get started today. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. This is the last week in mortgage today. I am Faith Howard Mooney, the SVP of member engagement here at the Mortgage Collaborative. And I have with me Nathan Seifer, who is the VP of Mortgage Lending at Green State Credit Union. Thank you for doing this with me, Nathan. Always. It's always good to see you and get the opportunity to connect. Yeah, yeah. And so for those of you who don't know, um, Nathan and I are both Iowa people. Um, so I always love it. It's my comfort zone when I have one of my Iowa peeps on with me that I feel like I know relatively well and just love chatting it up with for a while. So you caught us talking about weather and fall coming and summer um, summer uh, ending, which we don't like to talk about that one, but yeah. yeah. Um, and Bernard, thanks for being on too. I do consider you one, one of my Iowa peeps as well. So always appreciate it when you're on and in the chat with us. So I thought we would get started a little bit here today by just like talking a little bit about like what you're seeing in the markets that you are in. So maybe if you could just give like a little intro of who Green State is. Absolutely. So um, always happy to join these and get the opportunity to connect like old friends um, with you, Faith. So with Green State, um, we are the largest credit union in the state of Iowa, um, largest mortgage lender in the state of Iowa as well. Uh, but what, what's unique with us, we in the last couple of years, we've acquired essentially like an IMB um, from that standpoint in our Illinois market. So our footprint has expanded over. Um, we've gotten outside of Iowa. We're over into Illinois and a little bit of the surrounding counties that touch touch Iowa from that standpoint. Um, and so we've you know seen some really tremendous growth. Some great opportunities have presented themselves um, as a part of that acquisition with just the different programs and financing um, outlets that we've expanded into um, from doing some non-QM lending with um, partners um, to just, again, having some jumbo outlets as well. It's just been, a, it's been a great um, opportunity for us. And so for my Iowa team, so I manage our Iowa loan officers, um, and then we have a sales manager over in Illinois, but it's been good to just, to be able to collaborate, um, different ways of approaching sales from that standpoint, just that cross collaboration that can happen that IMB, they're more, uh, more gritty. Um, they can, they really do try to get, find it every opportunity, um, and how they approach every deal. It's, it's been, need to share with our Iowa team of, of how they kind of think about it and structure and look at the products and, and try to find that niche for, for every member that we do have. And so um, it's taken, you know, it's one of those where it's, it's conti a continuation. It's an evolving process, um, getting them into the great, the culture of a credit union. So I think credit unions are a little bit different from that standpoint, calling people yep. members, not customers um, from that standpoint, but, the markets are so very different. So Iowa, we're very fortunate that we still do have affordable housing. Um, and, you know, it's there's that ability for members to get into a starter home and it's not completely priced out or we're trying to figure out how to make it more affordable. There is tremendous opportunity. Um, we were kind of chatting that in Illinois, that market's just different. The housing prices are different in a Chicago metro. And so all of our um, loan officers, you know, over there, they're looking for every bit of opportunity. You know, we have some, we do, Fannie, Freddie, direct selling, but then we also have correspondent lenders that do have some unique community lending initiatives. And so making sure that we're looking at those outlets because they are using every arrow in their quiver 
to get members into homes and make it affordable and, and try to bridge that gap um, out there. So yeah. it's been a tremendous couple yeah. of years. It's so unusual to have, I would think anyway, I know that we haven't had it happen with anybody else in network that I'm aware of that a credit union purchased an IMB. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in an expansion effort. And you guys are just brave. You just will do things that other people don't necessarily do and step into it and say, we're going to, we're going to do this and see kind of what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so it's I think that is unique in and of itself. And then those two markets. So I grew up in Iowa. I kind of understand Iowa and, you know, there are more rural communities in certain parts of the state, definitely. I would imagine, though, some of the Iowa cities still affordable in, like, the Iowa cities still see affordable pricing there, or has that started to also be more competitive? No, that's, Iowa, we, like I says, we're still very fortunate to have affordable entry-level starter homes here that people can um, get into. Those are, you know, we've seen a decline in those. The inventory has been tough this year, right? We just haven't seen those people that want to give up their their rates and and move to a different home just yet. Um, hopefully, this knock on wood, this these rates continue the downward trend that we've enjoyed the last couple of weeks here. But from that standpoint, is that Iowa has been very fortunate. You know, we do have those in, in our markets, um, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, even in Des Moines, that there are those starter homes still coming in and that people can can step into. And then again, you see that progression that people step up into a different price point. And again. Um, just that progression, that upward movement um, of of homes through the membership. Right. So you're lucky in that respect. If you do have somebody that's moving up, then you've got a starter home to place somebody somebody else in. Um, that is that is a huge yeah. luxury that a lot of markets don't have right now. So you've got like you've got these people that were in an IMB now part of Green State in a completely different market. Mm -hmm. um, it essentially, I mean, kind of almost at least initially, you had to feel like it was two completely different businesses. How do you manage those things, you know, internally with your team? Are you making one team do the same thing everyone else? Are you trying to accommodate the other team in their style and just do a great big good old blend of best practices? Kind of what have you done there? Yeah, um, it's the latter on that, Faith, is that, you know, while we like to think we had it figured out, you can always learn. There's always opportunity. And I think that's one of the phenomenal things about just to put a plug in for TMC's um, events, the conference coming up, is that at those, just that sharing of ideas that you can do is is tremendous. And that's kind of what we benefited from with this acquisition that you come into it and there's so many things that they've done that they it, it works great. How can we plug it into our process? How can we blend these two to get the best of both worlds? Because there's so many good opportunities there. You've got so much talent um, just with the brain power. IMBs just run a little differently. They think differently, which is, is is the great part. So we did, I mean, I will say pretty quickly, we did rip the Band-Aid and bring everyone into the same system, our loan origination system, just to get that process started so we could use all of our resources. Obviously, it hit right about the right time of mortgage um, slowed down tremendously. And so we were trying to find efficiencies from that standpoint. Um, and so getting everyone into the same system set, you know, we have processors that are slow here, we can deploy them over there, utilizing all of our resources efficiently from that standpoint. But again, blending everything, bringing those two worlds together, we've got some great leadership from both sides that have come together. And it's an evolution. I'm going to just say that is that we're still getting through it. Um, two years later, actually almost two years exactly okay. that we're still learning trying to find you know that that right footing but um, i think we've made tremendous progress in that stand from that standpoint so it's been a fun um a fun project yeah absolutely absolutely i just think it's very cool that that is um that is something that you've been able to do and accomplish we all know that blending teams sometimes is from a cultural standpoint and everything is is a lot easier um, said than done. So kudos to you for being able to do that. Um, let's talk a little bit about, so the NAR settlement went into effect this weekend, Friday. Yeah. Was it Friday? Friday. I think it was Friday. It was Friday, Saturday, something like that on the 17th. Yeah. Um, have you seen, I mean, I'm kind of just curious. I love asking everybody this, like any immediate impacts in what people in your area are doing, are wanting to do, are people wanting to be dual 
you know, to have dual representation and it, it, what is going on? Share with me what yeah. you see is going on from those referral sources that you utilize. Yeah, so we, with with this whole change, uh, early in July, we actually, it's as with our realtor partners, it's a collaboration on that. So we brought in a couple of our realtor partners from our markets just to share what they're seeing, what they see coming down the pike. Um, basically created a realtor panel so our LOs could just hear from boots on the ground what's coming, how are they preparing for this change? Because it is a pretty big shift. We in mortgage can relate. We went from good faith estimates to um, our loan estimates and we did that in 2015. And so we've had those seismic shifts in our world. And so now it's happening on our partner's side of the world. Um, and so we felt it was really important to bring them into our team and say, hey, what are you doing to prepare? And so, you know, whether it's uh, the realtor sure that they're doing quite a bit of scripting is how do they sell themselves um, and present themselves to, to buyers? This is a different proposition, whereas they were just, it was built into this transaction. Thematic, you know, yeah. it just kind of happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so the scripting that they were, you know, a couple of the leading brokers shared that they're doing role playing with their team. And then we took it a step further and said, how can we help, you know, be a, a good partner um, with you guys? And so it's the piece of, you know, preparing two kind of scenarios. Like here's the scenario, if, if, which most of our listings still have. If it has buyer broker representation costs built in, here's kind of what you're looking at for this transaction. If it doesn't, here's kind of a worst case scenario. And so making sure that we present both of those options um, from that standpoint, but we've also seen our realtors really being getting more engaged and it's it's coming to us as a resource and saying, hey, how do I navigate this? What do I need to do? Um, and making sure that we've kept our, our loan officers up to date as much as we can through communication of here's the changes, you know, as far as VA does allow that buyer broker compensation change. Here's the wording providing those out so that they're hearing it consistently um, and just being available to the realtors. It, we wanted to make sure that they know that we're here to help just like they've helped us through changes in the past um, from that standpoint. So it's still early, um, but again, it's as with everything, we'll figure it out. We'll find our new groove um, and keep things keep things moving. Yeah, it, it um, is one of those interesting things that I think that mortgage has went through every change like possible, whether it be you know appraisal revamping to you know are you a broker? Are you a banker? Are you everything? And they're kind of like the last piece that has been untouched for a long period of time. So I'm sure this is a big mind shift for many of those people. Are you hearing that? Um, so it's always interesting to talk about like what commission structures have been and, and like what people are projecting. Are you hearing that um, compensation will go down or just split differently or you know what are you kind of what have you heard from those individuals that you work with so um so far i think it's a little early uh, to to know the full you know the full effects i think the doj their ultimate goal obviously as the doj is, is to uncouple it and to see those come down uh, yeah. to be a negotiating piece that you can it's not set it's not the same every time um, but we have seen some of those scenarios. We a handful have come through where it's the seller isn't covering it, and so they're negotiating directly with their buyer agent, saying, "Here's what I'm going to cover in this transaction." Similarly, is that there's been times where the seller isn't covering the full; they're doing a little bit, but the buyer's covering it. So we're starting to kind of see all of those different scenarios kind of come to play, and where our LOs are sharing that out, say, "Hey, I've got this one where it's going to be this percentage, but the seller's only covering this," um, and so we're just starting to kind of just to start to see those come through. Um, but now that it's fully been removed from the MLSs, that's where the questions did start to come in of how do, how do I handle this now that I don't know exactly um, my lane. Yeah. yeah, well, not a, yeah, don't know exactly their lane. And then it would be hard, you know, if you're competing against other people for your business, harder to be able to see and tell what your peers you know, in your peer group, what are they doing? What are yeah. they capturing? You know, are they breaking down their business so that, you know, they're only being paid to show, you know, homes to people or find homes for people? Or, you know, is it more of an a la carte? So I think that will be interesting to see, um, you know, as things continue to progress and and people start reporting on what's happening out there. 
Yeah, but I think it's that opportunity for us as loan officers to help those, you know, our strong realtor partners is to help sell that value proposition as saying, hey, working with so-and-so, you, they're a great partner. They're going to take great care of you that, you know, we can kind of really be that second, um, that second voice because obviously selling yourself is hard sometimes. But again, if you get that, you know, when they're, those buyers are coming in the door saying, hey, before I get started, what, what, what do I need to know? And so then making those connections and reaffirming the value of that. I think there's, there's intrinsic value for us as loan officers and in the mortgage side to help our realtor partners with this um, and coach them through it as well. Well, and I think one of the things, I mean, this is maybe just like a super, you know, optimistic or hopeful thought process. I think one of the things when changes like this happens, it's almost like everybody gets the sense that they need to step up their game a little bit. And I'm yeah. thinking that it's going to, the agents are going to realize they do need to become more of an educator and handhold. It's kind of like when refinances happen for loan officers and they just drop out of the sky, right? It's <laughs> easy to kind of forget how to do some of the other pieces of it's, the business. Number one, you're so busy. Yeah. And number two, people have just navigated it themselves. And I think this kind of like resets the stage maybe a little bit. Well, it's back to the basics, right? I mean, it's like what happened when mortgage in 2022 when rates shot up um, that we had to get back to the basics and, and get back to what we had done. We weren't in autopilot anymore. You couldn't just pick up the phone and go. And we're seeing that with the realtors too, is like, it's getting back to that, that human interaction. I think that's where it's great to have this right now is people need that, that guidance. They want that guidance and they're seeking out an advisor that can really take them through both the buying side, which the realtors have, and then us as a financial expert, helping them navigate this whole new landscape. Yeah. And I'm just, I, so this is just how my brain thinks and it's maybe a little bit weird, but I'm thinking that like the stage is being set and prepping the real estate agents to get ready for all of the new buyers that have never been in the market before to come into the market when we have housing for them to purchase. And they're going to have their whole skill set rehoned um, and be the greatest at explaining things and helping people through the process when that happens. So that's where my mind goes. Yeah, maybe we're being overly optimistic, but I, I like to think the same faith is that glass half full, that it's it's gonna be a, a level up for everyone across the board. Yeah, yeah, I think that's awesome. Are you seeing, um, you know, in the markets that you guys serve and with your people, are are, are you seeing agents go down the path of wanting to not only be a real estate agent, but being an LO at the same time? And I'm just curious if you are, how you navigate that with these close real estate agents, you know, that you've developed that maybe aren't looking to go down that same path. Yeah, we've, so we haven't seen a ton of it. Um, there are a couple that have popped up here. I know in Iowa that are doing that, that they've gotten, the dual licensure piece um, of it. If I have had a couple LOs ask about it, just like, what does that look like? I'm hearing about this, you know, there's housing wires put out a couple of articles about it. You're starting to see a little bit more chatter around this. Um, and so again, I think it's a little early to see exactly what that looks like, you know, um, how how a consumer or a slash member responds to something like that. It's, it's It'll be interesting to see where that, where that goes and how that takes off from that standpoint, Faith. Um, but again, we're starting to see a little bit of that just just starting to come into it. So it's but I'm curious because I think both of those are kind of specialized roles that people have. It's really hard to, as an LO, if you've got a lot of products to understand all the ins and outs of a product, the same mm -hmm. thing prepping people for buying or what they're going to experience after they own their home or finding all of those homes. I almost see like those as two separate roles. I'm wondering if it, it it's going to play out that it's better to have two specialists you know, like working with you or one generalist that, you know, kind of understands, because I think it would be hard to know all of those things and not necessarily to learn all of those things, but to stay on top of all of those things as the mm -hmm. market changes. It's just a lot of information to retain. Um, and maybe there are some niche people that really have that brain power that are probably a lot younger and have a lot younger brain than I have. But I just think I almost see those two things as two specialties versus versus one generalist. But I realize. I, yeah, I think I would agree with that. That's but again, uh, time will tell on that from to see who adopts and who take or how that takes off. 
exactly, exactly. Um, one of the things that was in the news this week was home buyers enjoyed the benefit of the smallest year over year housing payment <laughs> increase. I'm not sure that's something we should be celebrating, but um, um, ending the last four weeks of August 11th, um, Redfin came out with that. Um, also nearly 20% more inventory year over year um, and 5% year over year decrease in the number of homes selling above their listing price. Have you begun to see, like, I think I was relatively, I equate Iowa to some of the places in Texas that have always remained at least kind of relatively stable, not with the big peaks and the ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a softening market in the Chicagoland area at all? It, not yet. I mean, those we're still seeing uh, over in that market competitive offers um, come into play. Again, the thing I think it, it's tough is as I were thinking about this today, those buyers that are not a conventional, you know, when you have a, a FHA buyer, RLOs are still trying to make sure because those offers often get, unfortunately, people are concerned about having to get through an FHA type of financing scenario. And so oh. we haven't seen that change yet where it's like that. Um, has come fully back into play. We're starting to see more FHA originations, but you know the, those offers, they're going through three and four um, contracts before they get into a fully accepted a, a agreement, just because, again, they have others that are competing. We've seen a tremendous more um, deals of, that are cash. So we get some of reporting oh, okay. uh, from our, our realtor partners, and the, the cash transactions continue to remain strong, Faith. Um, just with these higher interest rates, we're seeing people do pull money from different places. They have really wonderful families that are giving gifts for some of these. It's just, it's very interesting to see the number of cash transactions out in the market still um, at this time. Oh. But our housing prices in in Iowa and Illinois have, have remained stable, which is always um, good to see. We don't, like you said, we don't see those high highs and low lows. We just, we're kind of even keel, even as it goes, but we do see the, the increases happening. I mean, it's, it's not the coasts, but our members have benefited from those, the appreciation we've seen. Right, right. Uh, I've thought about moving back to Iowa. Now I have a kid that keeps me here, but the thought process is because his dad's from Iowa as well. And it's like, you know, we could probably sell our houses here and live a little bit differently there when we retire. So we've started, it's kind of funny. We started talking we about that. We can connect you yeah. when you hear Faith. Yeah, <laughs> I will for sure. Um, in the U.S., the total value of U.S. homes gained $3.1 over the past 12 months. Um, that's like a huge um, $49.6 um, is what the um, what housing is at right now. 6.6 .6 year over year growth in the U.S. housing market. For where we're at now, it's very obvious that like generational wealth, still the best thing to earn generational wealth it is still housing. Um, I would just love to hear, you know, you're in a super stable market. Do you think that, you know, we're reaching a peak here, just like in your opinion? And at, I mean, at some point, I think things can't continue to go up and up and up and maybe at least flatten out. Um, yeah. Indications from people that you work with on like where you think that's at, or is it not in your world that maybe, I mean, we've already heard Florida kind of has been impacted a little bit by some of those things. Is yeah. it more of a postal occurrence? You know, it, it'll be interesting to see is that, you know, we're, we're fortunate that we don't see those tremendous increases, but um, I think we'll see it leveling out. You know, the bigger thing that we're facing here in Iowa and a little bit in Illinois, kind of skipping back to the, the affordability piece, home ownership, um, excuse me, homeowners insurance continues to be a driving factor. We're, we're in Iowa um, a couple of four years ago now, almost four years ago, we had an inland hurricane, a derecho come through. And so we're seeing insurance companies pulling out of the market. And, and when it comes time for escrow analysis, where I go with that is that we are seeing tremendous increases on the insurance side that it's creating some pain points for members that are in homes that they are used to a, a premium. It's a 800 a year and now it's jumping to 1600. And so that payment shock, we're seeing that happen, um, which is, is just an interesting piece of the affordability back to that payments have been level here in Iowa. We're seeing kind of a little bit of a, a spike in some of those payments and it's our servicing team is really working through that. Um, we're seeing insurance companies leave just like Florida. So equated to that, 
the risk yeah. in Iowa with hail, with wind has put us on the map that people don't want to do insurance here. So um, that's that. been one of our, one of our um, pain points. It, you know, it's great that the housing, you have affordability, but then we've had to retool our LOs to say, hey, put in an insurance premium that's reasonable because that can make the make or break an approval for some of our, our members out there. Um, I was just going to ask you, so has that changed your, because I know in other places, New Orleans and California, Florida, it's really changed a lot of lender members process. It used to be insurance was kind of like an afterthought almost that it's like, okay, two days before closing, it's like, shoot, I've got to go get my yeah. insurance. Right. And now yeah. it's, like if you do that, you could be in for a real shocker. And in some instances, if you were close to qualifying, maybe not even qualify anymore. So have you changed your process related to that with those things beginning to happen there that get this up front so we know what we're dealing with versus have it be that kind of at the end of the process sort of thing? We're, we're certainly working towards that. That's a great the, the old, you could just get it in 24 hours, get bound coverage and be on your way. Those days for, at least for us in some of these central states where we're experiencing the, the increase in um, storms and claims from that standpoint, it is taking longer. They're doing a little more due diligence up front and they're going to look at a property and they're, they're not just binding coverage immediately. And so we are trying to get that moved up. And I think until an LO experiences that that hiccup right at the end, it's kind of been adult. It's kind of funny because some hit it and they're like, okay, I've got to get this moved up. And you can only say so much until you're blue in the face. And then they have to go through it and live that pain of that closing gets delayed an hour or two to get that insurance coverage. Um, uh, but they are starting to shift it up early in the process saying, Hey, make sure you're getting on this. Make sure you, you know, look around for some quotes because we're seeing quite a bit of variance in premiums here in our market. And it again, changes that member's payment expectation as well. Yeah. All they need to do is get up with hit up with their annual annual escrow analysis on their own market, <laughs> and then yeah. like me, and then they'll have a, a new appreciation for what's going on yes. out there in the world. It always has way more impact when it hits you personally. Um, yep. That is for sure. Um, let's talk just a little bit about like home equity and what is going on there. So with all of these housing, you know, increases. People have a lot of cash a lot of times in their house itself and are doing home equities. Um, it it kind of surprised me, to be honest with you, with where things are at. And maybe it shouldn't have because people just aren't moving. So if they're tired of something in their house, they're doing a home repair or they spend more time in their house now. And so they've decided they're going to if we're going to be here for another two years, we're going to do a home improvement that we put off or, or whatever that is. So it didn't yeah. surprise me, I guess, greatly that, you know, the bulk of home equities, that's what they're being done for. But there were two categories that that kind of did take me by surprise. 30% of home equities, debt consolidation. Maybe that shouldn't be surprising. Um, maybe the combined payments of whatever debt you're paying off, even at a higher interest rate, makes more sense, especially if it's credit card debt. But the one that I thought was the funniest was 11% there is no good reason. <laughs> I saw that too. Yeah. It's... Like, no good reason. I'm just taking the cash, the cash and running. Right. I yeah. mean, it's like, what do you suppose? I mean, the, the whole debt consolidation kind of makes sense. Have you seen people kind of doing that and taking advantage of that, even though the rates are a little bit higher? We, we absolutely have. And so we have a, a very strong home equity line of credit product, a home equity loan product that our retail side of the credit union does for us. One of the things that we, to that point though, Faith, is that members that have these low mortgages, they're trying to figure out how to stay in that house and make it last longer for them. And so on our side of, of the origination world, we put into it, it's been out there, but we revamped it is that uh, they can keep their current first mortgage, but we put a construction piggyback home equity loan into place that allows them to go and do remodel without touching that first, it puts in a nice um, second. So it gives us a, a nice earning yield on the, that higher interest loan, yeah. um, but gives them the flexibility that they can expand that house. They can, we can do an ad, uh, subject to appraisal and give them that ability to make that house what they want and continue to live in and make it work for the future for them while retaining that great low rate on the first. And so in some scenarios, that's made a lot of sense uh, for our members, but we're trying to be open to all those opportunities that are available um, 
with with the equity that we're seeing here in Iowa and Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. And we've had a couple of lender members mention to us that, you know, with um, credit card debt is the highest it's ever been in the U.S. economy. And with that happening, they've been able to run through the scenario of this is what you're paying with your credit card debt and your 2.8 percent. Right. And then at at six and a half percent or whatever that number is. Yeah. This is what you're paying if you get rid of that debt and show the discrepancy between it because of the really high credit card debt that I think some lender members have been kind of taking advantage of some of those scenarios to get people in a better overall financial um, situation. I'm curious if you've got a, a guess on what the there is no good reason equates to as we wrap up the show here today. <laughs> I think it's that just that cash on hand piece is that I think people there's they, they were used to having savings during uh, the COVID days. They had money piling up and then they've gone through it. Yeah. So they're consolidating that debt and then they just want some to just have on hand, that yeah. emergency yeah. slush fund. I call that my sleep at night money. Um, yeah. That's that's what I call it. It's that little reserve that lets you not worry about other things that you may feel like are going to happen or that are unexpected that exactly. happen every once in a while. So I guess everybody needs a little bit more sleep at night money um, yeah. in their camp, but yeah. It's the end of the last week in mortgage today. It always goes by so quickly. It's always so enjoyable to just chat with you for a while about what's going on in your world and getting caught up. I'm sad we're not gonna see you in Denver, but I know that your partner in crime, Ryan Dorman has been on here cheering for you in the background. <laughs> um, I'm happy that we're gonna see him and everyone else that is there. We still have availability for people to join us. So if you still wanna join us in Denver, we're two and a half weeks out at this point. Um, and we will be talking about a lot of these topics that we talked about today in um, greater detail. Nathan, come back anytime you want. It's always a joy um, to talk Likewise. with you. Thank you for doing this today. Absolutely. Good. Always good to see you and everyone. Thanks, Faith. Yep. We'll see all the rest of you next Tuesday at the same time.